Okay, got it. All right. Welcome everyone. And we are up to good crack number eight. And today is eight? July, you said eight? Eight, eight, eight. eight already. Today's July 14th, 2021. We'll orient ourselves to time. Um, welcome back. And it's been a little bit of a hiatus, uh, but we're ready to roll. So we were talking about the possibility of discussing the word consciousness. I've noticed lately that it's come up quite a bit in public discourse. When I listen to people's podcasts, a lot of people use the word now, much more so than it ever used to be. And it got me to thinking, well, how do, how do they use that word? What are they thinking when they, when they use that word? And, and the context seems to me to imply that it's thoughts, that they equate consciousness with thoughts. Well, when someone gets knocked out, they're unconscious, right? Uh, they've, mm -hmm. they've, now they've come back to consciousness. And then there's that time-worn phrase of uh, raising our consciousness. Mm. So the way- It's like a little baby, you raise it a consciousness. You raise it up, you raise it, right, right. Goes through stages. Um, so I thought it would be helpful for us to have a conversation around it because it seems that when we were studying yoga and the yoga sutras and Samkhya, that consciousness meant pure awareness that was always my understanding of the same it. problem don't we <laughs> what do you mean what's, what's pure awareness <laughs> right, right, right. okay okay we're doing the same thing you know what i mean good like, okay so no so go ahead we'll flush that out what you know yeah, yeah. so you have to use language somehow to describe your experience mm -hmm. yeah and so people are trying desperately to um just be more present, I think, and to be more engaged and not, they've been uh, disengaged from the artificial schedules that they were rammed into from, from birth, um, essentially, and mm -hmm. really just ripped right out of that matrix in the past year and a half. So they've had time to maybe get their bearings and reevaluate and so maybe that's why this word is coming up more frequently that, you know, we need to raise our consciousness. We need to be conscious. We need to um, be conscious of this and conscious of that. So um, I don't know, I think I need some help in seeing how would we distinguish between the vernacular consciousness and consciousness from a spiritual length as a spiritual language a descriptive hmm. as awareness just do you see a problem with the various uses the the multiplicity of uses of the word do you well i get the feeling yes like it's taking people away down a path of just being up in their heads about it and that it's not so much an experiential awareness, the pure awareness of something without all the overlay and thinking that, that, that it's a malleable thing that they can take a hammer and chisel and you know make a new awareness, make a new consciousness. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, and the other, language that seems to go along with that 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 maybe they're using it synonymously is we would like to use the word vibration oh i haven't heard that one that's new to me right i'm going into a higher vibration well in, in a, <laughs> a uh, higher vibration <laughs> yes i like that yes but, so that well i mean we and you know so there's a certain sense to it because you know we, we talk about much we talk about you know, vibration at the at the heart of creation. We talk about spunda, things like that, which is um, which is really the 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 um, 
the doctrine of vibration as it's as it's translated from uh, Kashmiri Shaivism. Um, but that seems to be another and, and one of the the narratives that has been going on for the last you know well at least we've been aware of it for the last you know five or six years is that that there's an ascension and for us to ascend we need to raise our vibration that's pretty much the language that's being used and we're going and then and then it goes to a place where i really can't go which is you know we're moving from the third dimension and uh, up to the fifth dimension, right? And so that there's these, and, and I don't understand really what anybody means, nor is that anyone, and most of the channeled work and things like that is, is along these lines where, you know, we're, we're supposed to be um, vibrating at a higher level so that the whole planet can move up to another vibration um, or yeah, then, they, then this goes in the other thing is that it bifurcates and then you know the people who want to hang out in the in the crummy third dimension like we are in now um wait a minute speak for yourself there buddy that's true <laughs> that's true or you can you can you can uh, you can join the fifth dimension which is one of my favorite groups growing yeah, up. i go i knew you were gonna go i had, I had <laughs> a lot of their, not? had a lot of their up up and away in my beautiful balloon there you go um so actually, that's how I learned the, the the Declaration of Independence. They actually sang oh, it. That's on, right. They did. Sang it on one of their records. Do you remember that? that? Yeah. I never really knew much about that. Yeah. yeah. Well, they, they you know they they were just had golden voices. Anyway, so that's another of the narratives. But somehow I think that when people use consciousness, they use it like this sort of vibration slash being or something. You know. Um, I don't know, like not feeling crappy or something. I, I, I don't know what, whether it's associated with, you know, their internal feeling. So their internal, um, you know, how they're going about their day, feeling crummy, feeling happy, feeling whatever. Um, I get the feeling that uh, because we've been going through a dark period that maybe people feel like the answer is to raise your consciousness, raise your vibration, and then that will lift everybody else up. You know, like it's some kind of homeopathic thing to do. Mm. Um, I don't know how else the, I'm speaking for them. I'm just getting votes, like, votes. sorry. Right. That, yeah. Kind of like that. But, um, I'm just feeling like that's how people are looking at it in this very, almost like a materialistic way. Well, that consciousness is malleable and can be formed to your will. Like clay, modeling clay. Like clay would work, you know. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. And then the other side of it is, before I, I'll let you speak soon, Jean. Um, oh, that's all right. I'm enjoying it. <laughs> Is, um, I'm being exposed to a lot of their ideas that I haven't heard before. You've not. So what? What? Have, what are you not? Well, familiar no, the other with side it? of it. I just want to say the other side before I forget okay. because I forgot once already. Is um, <laughs> is is this avoidance also? It's like I don't want to look at what's really going on because, you know, because it's going to lower my consciousness to look at, you know, the lower my vibration experiences that exist as it exists. You know, I don't want to, I don't want to talk about, you know, whatever things that are going on that may or may not be pleasant. And I just want to smell the flowers because it, because it brings me down. Remember um, the hurricane where all the, um, the, the one that hit New Orleans and they all ended up going into the Astrodome. Oh yeah. Right. And, and, uh, and Barbara Bush, Barbara Bush, Barbara Bush said, well, for one, she said, look at them, you know, this, they're doing really well they here. They never had it, it so good. Yeah, like they never had it so good. Uh, but there was something about the distress that the people were under. And she said, well, why would I ruin my beautiful mind with thinking about that was her. Instead topic. of drinking a bottle of vodka. Well, it was a paraphrase, yeah. Um, yeah. but it was something like that. Yeah. Why should I ruin my beautiful mind worrying about that? 
you know, well, gosh. Yeah. So what was that? The what was the? That's it. Uh, that's all. I was just um, bringing up the fact that there's. So I we covered, I guess, a number of variations on what we we think people are. You know, you you with the way it's mostly used. You know, the, the conscious is it seems to be, uh, uh, you know, tuned to a vibration. This sort of you know this sort of inner experience or feeling, um, and you know and and. Um, and the word being keeps on coming up, but I don't think that that's the way they're, you know, like once at one point we were meditating just on being alive. Mm -hmm. You know, what does it mean? What does it feel like to be alive? Just to be alive. Yeah. And, and, and you know, we've also brought up the silence and things like that, that, that um, really forms the, um, I don't know the, the circumstance that of being alive that we that we live within, you know. So what what is I'm curious now. You've got my curiosity peak. What what is it that you you're not familiar with that that we? Well, the vibration okay. thing for one. I didn't. I never equated consciousness with vibration, like uh, Steve alluded to. Some people doing. Okay. Now, spanda is, is not consciousness, but it right. imply, in the within the framework of Shaivism, spanda and consciousness work hand in hand. But spanda is different than consciousness, mm -hmm. unless, unless they different the forms sure. of consciousness. Right. There's the consciousness of movement and phenomenal creation, so to speak, experiential creation, and then there's the consciousness that's witnessed to that movement. But it's an intrinsic part, like form and color. You can differentiate them, distinguish them, but you can never separate them. Mm, this con the consciousness of Shaivism, you cannot separate from phenomena or from the movement of the spanda, which gives rise to all phenomena. Yeah, that's well, okay. So there are two aspects to consciousness. Vedanta has a very similar yeah. thing where it's united in what they call Brahman. And Brahman has two sense, two reality senses to it, if you will. I speak loosely there when I use the word reality. On the one hand, you have the near guna Brahman, mm -hmm. which is the Brahman without qualities, as some people translate that. And then you have the sa guna Brahman, which is with quality, Brahman with qualities, this reality. And the one with qualities is the movement of experience. Oh, okay. So and that would be the phenomenon. The yes, movement of phenomena. And then the okay. other side of that is the awareness that is intrinsic to it, but is not identical to it. It, you can't dis, you can distinguish between them and that's the goal of liberation is to distinguish that form of awareness from phenomena from the other form distinguishing nirguna brahman from saguna brahman is in some ways very important ways equitable with liberation from suffering because nirguna brahman is eternally free it doesn't undergo the transformations uh, it doesn't feel suffering. It doesn't acknowledge suffering in the sense that the egocentric mind will. I don't like this. It's terrible. You know, we have preferences. The, the awareness of Nirguna Brahman has no preferences. It's indifferent to whatever arises and falls in experience. Right. Sort of like when Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita says, uh, wind does not blow it, water does not wet it, fire does not burn it. That's right. right? So there's always that that aspect in all experience. Yeah, that's right. All experience has that according to the, each of these systems. Yoga and Samkhya decide to keep the language of that consciousness distinct, calling it the seer or purusha or the witness, the indifferent one, the experiencer. And then on the other side, you have prakriti, which is the movement of phenomenal manifestation mm -hmm. and its source, or the source of all phenomena. Right. That's, That's mula prakriti, the root. Mm, right. mm. So they, but those, so a lot of Westerners get a hold of Sankhya and say, oh, that's a metaphysics, a, a dualistic metaphysics. They weren't thinking in those terms. They were looking at their experience and seeing that there are two levels to their experience, inseparable, but distinguishable. You like can't separate. example of the color and form. So they, that's right. they have that same separate. kind of relationship. Right, right. That's Wherever really you have helpful. form, you have color. That's really helpful. Really yeah. helpful. You yeah. can't remove consciousness from phenomena. 
that's how a lot of people go wrong when they translate the word Kai volume from the Samkhya school of thought and yoga. They translate it as isolation. Mm -hmm. right? So they seek to separate it from the movement of phenomena or experiential content. You don't separate it. You realize there's a deep underlying distinction there where consciousness, the seer, the purusha, is distinct from manifest phenomena or the movement of experience do you do you remember that book i think it was a buddhist book called alone with others yeah that was stephen bachelor wrote a book right, right. with others yeah i never read the full book i i, I, I kind of i'm not a big stephen bachelor fan well but. i think i think i started to read it years ago and because of the, i was intrigued by the title but it didn't capture me when I actually started to read the text. Yeah, yeah. But I never forgot the title. It is a good title. I like it too. Yeah. Because And now that really seems to capture what you're saying there with form and, and awareness of the form, the phenomenology and the, <laughs> the thought about it or the, the awareness yeah. of it, right? Yeah, you're using the phrase in that way. I agree. It can be used that way. I right? like it. I like that usage. Yes. Right. So you're, you know, it is with, you know, this embedded awareness, mm -hmm. but it's it's distinct. It's alone in its awareness, in in not its, but in awareness. It is awareness. I right. mean, that's what we would say. It is awareness. Yet if you're going to use the term awareness. I mean, you know, all of these terms, consciousness, awareness, mind, these are all inventions. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no such thing as consciousness. There's no such thing as mind. What are the, the only way you can have a consciousness is to have someone make it up. You know, it's a word, mm -hmm. but it's, it, it, you, you, we use it in, con in, in conjunction with each other intersubjectively. So we, we invent terms that will capture something we want to convey to others and then they take on a life of their own because they become you mean there's no such thing as the mind well what is it tell me what it is show it to me or consciousness what is it i mean you can't say what it is that's why there's so many different variations on the, on the usage and mind too that word has been used so many different ways east west up down all all different kinds you know what i'm saying yeah, and but then you have to have some kind of convention of speech. Mm -hmm. That's right, we in do. In order to, you know, so you have to say, okay, yeah, yes, it needs to be flexible and yeah. you know, like being able to move. Yep. However, if it undulates too much, it well, loses it's, its its usefulness, really, because it then it be, just goes it off the charts. against us and for us, depending on how wise we are in its usage. Right. It's and it's also a product of you know of a, of the modern world really. It's well, like, it goes back boy, you know, way before when, that. When look at mythology. Look at what mythology. It's all made up. Same thing. Yeah, I mean, right? The yeah. cosmos. Where did it come from? You know the ratios. Right, but I'm saying the words were less less multivalent in in a stable society. What, is there a such thing as a stable society? Well, maybe not. <laughs> Got me there. But relatively I don't even more know what stable. society means. Well, That's well let's just say more, more, cult, more culturally uniform than, than ours. So your tendency <laughs> is to want to put something together in a uh, linguistic package that appears to reflect something beyond itself. That's a tendency we Westerners have real strongly. It's a reification. You know, a reification means giving, spending something in reality it doesn't have, basically. So you think that's more of a Western quality? No, I think it's a human quality. Okay. But Western philosophical discourse is very much oh. engaged or was in, uh, in reification, metaphysics, mm -hmm. Western metaphysics, whereas the East had a way of emptying that out through the sacrifice in the Rig Veda, for example, mm -hmm. and through meditation practices, mm -hmm. drugs, if they were used properly in mm -hmm. sacrament, in sacrament always, <clears throat> excuse me. So you have a different approach to language and, you, and they saw its limitations. Whereas in the West, we have this obsession with knowledge as theory. 
Whereas yeah. knowledge, that, that's only one mm -hmm. level of knowledge. Right, that's, there's that's, a whole nother level. There's several levels mm -hmm. you could say, we could say about how the worlds come into existence through our body minds, if you like that language. But Ill, language is always tentative. And that's what the East knew. And that was instituted from the very beginning of these myths in the sacrificial rites that people employed. And I'm sure it took place in the West too. I just don't know enough about Western mythology to comment on that. Maybe Steve can help us there. But well, well yet you know, yeah, and yet it was the um, the Vedic sacrifice reached a point where they actually had to have a separate priest to make sure everything was said absolutely correctly. Yes. Right. The yes. Bra the Brahman. That's where the word Brahman comes from, right? If I'm not mistaken. Right, the, or, or maybe it was a separation, but the Brahmin priest was the one who had to know the whole ritual. And yeah, when something it. wasn't said right, he had to get it, he had to go over right, it and say exactly. it right. Yeah. yeah, yeah, a lot of dogmas began to set in as well with all that, too. And so that's why the Upanishads were the subsequent literature was meant to clarify the earlier revelations and so on and so on. So, mm -hmm. and you still have it moving on. It's always it's like Buddhism was an attempt to clarify a lot of the situation that was going on with the giants, with the Sankhikas. And so the Buddha came along with his language his, to, under, to undermine the dogmatic inclinations in the human mind to reify language, you know, and let go. But, and meditation is the premier right now, the premier way of doing that because it quiets the mind and allows for other possible ways of seeing things to interact with us to to become for us and that ends dogma dogma is real dangerous and if you look at what when when we talk about narratives that are current or popular today mainly derived from the internet or podcast whatever the tele mainstream media wherever it comes from people think that when they hear that language that it's referring to something outside of it like the mainstream news like it, there's, it's referring to some world. It doesn't exist. It's a, just a narrative. And it exists for the moment because that's where it's being lived. That narrative is being lived then. And we say, boy, aren't things terrible in the world? And then someone comes up and we hear a little baby outside laughing. And we go, oh, look how beautiful. Where is the light? Where is, what's more real? I mean, the baby's beauty of laughter, that's overpowers the, uh, Joe, the, the, the Joe Biden administration taxation things or whatever, I don't care, you Maybe. know? So li language lives now and we don't see that anymore. We think language is some kind of eternal verity, eternal truths that will stay that way. We don't live in the same worlds. No, no. And, the, and the outside and the a reified outside world is, is an addiction. Yeah. It really is. It's really hard to break it, you know? And it is. You know, as you said, meditation and, and whatever, but uh, is 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 you know key. Yes, but um, it is. It really is an addiction. Yeah, it sure is. That's, from the time we're taught, little children, we're taught to think our way to know things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, our, our senses are deprived. We don't we don't indulge our sensorium. We want to know about our sensorium. We want to explain what happens in the digestion process, not feel it. Right. We, and we want to explain what knowledge is, yeah. not use it. You know, it's like when we talk about consciousness in, in Western philosophy, we're, we think we're talking about something and then we can have arguments and then we can have whose argument is the better argument and that'll last for a while and somebody will come up with a more ingenious argument and they all think they're talking about something. They're just talking. That's all he is. That's true. Now it has practical consequences. Steve built recently built a beautiful bookcase. I never got the picture of it. I'm very disappointed. Oh. But I can't wait to see my book. Oh, still when, in the only, garage. Only when there's books in it. Oh, okay. You don't want to cover you want to cover up the mistakes, huh? <laughs> With the books. No, I'm just looking forward to seeing it. But you, so we have these dimensions and we can use knowledge to craft things like Steve built the bookcase. You know, and that's where it becomes we can implement our language. And we do the same thing with science. It's an implementation of a language, right? 
Yeah, I mean, yeah, certain standardizations like like inches mm -hmm. when you're building yeah. something are useful. Yes, and it, do you ever see that? I know we've I, we might have talked about this recently. I'm not sure, but how these measurements came into existence in large in some measure. They were taken from the foot of a king or a prince or something. So you had the foot. Yeah, stride. Yeah, yeah, this was a, this was a cubit. There you go. There you go. Yeah. Right. So. Yeah. Very practical. Very. Yeah. <laughs> very immediate. Yeah. 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 That stadia. Was stadia was if you know, big distances were measured in stadiums. Yeah. Isn't that something? In the in the, in the Greek and Roman times. So now yeah, a stadium is a place. Yeah. So the stadia, stadia refers sure a to standard, a, yeah. the, the physical building. Right, right. So there was one that was a standard. What, what must have been a standard, yeah. I guess. Okay. There's, you know, whatever. Okay. So many, so many uh, steps, you know, steps, of course. And, and of course, they all, they all really correlate to, you know, to the measure of the earth, which is what geometry means, earth measure. Earth measure, yeah. And it was that was that was brought about by a human need. Whose property is whose? And all of these. Where should I put this? And well, how do you measure will rise here and Plant that. And all these human needs bring about all this. A human desire brings about all of this. Yeah. So if you're building language. a house, you have to know about measure. Yeah. Right. Right. And and then also if you if you're building. Um, a sanctuary or, or something to the gods, you would you would have to know which of the um, the harmonious ratios are more pleasing to them. Oh, that's interesting, isn't it? You know, yeah. so you would build, you know, the Parthenon on the golden mean proportion. And you might you And know. how would we know such a thing? Um, you ask. They tell us, you know you what I mean? Them. You ask. Yeah, you and then they, they, well, then they you experience you. something in you. Well just like you know Indra talks to the Right. Talks to the Vedic poets. That's right. And inspire them. And they yeah. were inspired. Some of them were through Soma. And they heard the mantras. They yeah. heard the hymns. They were yeah. given the hymns. And that's yeah. just like we're given thoughts. They weren't like Bob Dylan hammering on a typewriter, crossing shit out and, you know, you know, banging away. And, oh, man, I'm disappointed. You <laughs> know, you know, the, the other people may think other things about Bob Dylan, but, you know. Well, there are still people who really or, think he's the greatest. So. Yeah, or the, um, you know, I, I love the contrast between um, Mozart and Beethoven. You know, it was like you got me there. I don't know anything. Mo about well, Mozart is basically, you know, given, given. I mean, he lived to thirty-five, and you know, a thousand, you know, pieces of work. You know, he just it just poured out of him. Yeah. You know, it was completely jealous. We were, I was like, Beethoven is like sweating over every note, and you know, <laughs> the, you can't you can't read it because you know the, the drippings on the, uh, you know, on the score and things like that. And then the poor guy couldn't even couldn't even hear. Yeah, that's right. Wrote. Yeah, right. I forgot about that. And he could still write music, isn't that? Because he had the yeah, internal. That amazing. Yeah. yeah, he could, but he could. But that that goes back to the vibration because he could feel the vibration. I don't know. I never read. I don't know what he said about that. I don't know for sure what he, you know, how he heard it or whatever, but it could be vibration. Well, there's a woman named oh, Evelyn Glenny, um, who is a Scottish, um, like, orchestral percussionist. Mm -hmm. And she's lost her hearing completely at oh. some point, maybe very young. But she plays vibraphones, tympanum, you know, all sorts of orchestral percussion. She when she's with an orchestra, she's barefoot. Oh wow! And she, she feels the follows pool. through the vibration. Wow, that's amazing. She feels the vibration. Of course, you know you'll be much without having to bother with uh, actual sound, right? You, right. <laughs> you'd, be, you'd be you'd be you know uh, more attuned to it. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. The body, uh, as opposed to just the relationships between notes and such. Right. And she, you know, and she doesn't you know she doesn't miss a beat. Yeah, that's amazing. Well, I've heard that about people who are blind as well. And yeah. well, well, Scott, right? Um, but um, but they their other senses are more highly developed. So oh, I've heard, yeah, I've heard. So their yeah. sense of hearing, their sense of touch, their sense of smell, yeah, is directional to them. It gets them around. Yeah, yeah. yeah there's this guy on Bandcamp that I really like, Scott. Lola. Scott Lawler, L-A-W-L-R. Uh, he was in Texas, 
and I was, you know, I just thought I kind of came across his music and I was just picking it up and then he would thank me and we started the conversation and I was writing to him for, I don't know, like a year before, um, before he told me he was blind. Oh, wow. He sent me a picture of him uh, like uh, skydiving, like holding on to somebody. <laughs> and I still couldn't figure it out, you know, until he had, he had actually tell me, you know, because I just didn't imagine. And this guy is like unbelievably, basically he puts things out like in the order of, of a CD a week. No kidding. And mostly you know, like ambient and drone and things like that. But um, yeah, because well, it's, I guess that's pretty much all he does. All I do is write down a list of names when I talk to you, too. You're always giving me information that I never hear about. Anyway, he's a, he's a sweet guy, and I like supporting his music. Well, yeah. that's good. I'm going to check him out. Maybe I can do the same. Yeah. What is his name Scott, again? Scott Lawler, L-A-W-L-O-R. L-A-W-L-O-R. And, he do, and, and on top of the music he, he puts out, he does these you know, YouTube concerts. Have, oh really that'll last for like three hours or something like that yeah, you get them on so, band camp yeah. yeah some of his stuff yeah and he goes into this, this what's called you know talk about language right you know of course it's just not ambient there's like 40 different kinds of ambient dark you know, ambient, dark ambient. ambient. Uh, yeah i know it's really gotten wild yeah, hasn't it from the old doom, days doom doom. ambient and you know whatever hmm. yeah you know excuse me you know i mean you remember when we were growing up it was just you know, there was one bin. It was in alphabetical order, and that was basically it. Music yeah. at the airports. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know. So now, what happened to consciousness? <laughs> we went away. <laughs> went away. That's right. <laughs> Just gone. It's you know, I was Steve mentioned something important before when he's talking about how hard it is, how addicted we are to our thinking. You know, you wake up in the morning. And what we go right into is the narrative. We start believing. No kidding. Mm -hmm. And it just takes us, and you have to be very disciplined to say, wait a minute, that's not being my, very mindful. I have to bring yourself back to the quiet that makes that narrative possible. That's st sentient silence, I call it. And that's, why, that's where we're rooted. That's awareness. That's pure awareness right there. That's what I, there's many names you can give it. Right. But it is that which makes possible our experience of all different phenomena. Sounds, sights, everything. And as isn't that where it comes in then with the Pratipaksha Bhavanam of, of well, yeah, I got, you got to tell people what that means. Yeah, cultivating an opposite <laughs> okay, thought sorry. that to your oppressive thought. If you have something yes. oppressive in your mind, then yeah. you just cultivate an op. Not just Steve hates it when I say just. Yeah. <laughs> you you cultivate an opposite thought. What's your problem? Very simple. Yeah. And um, I think. Yeah, and the morning is a time when you can see that at play very oh, clearly. Yeah. yeah, it takes a bit of training and discipline to really use the mind to redirect to the silence, to the source, so to speak. And um, and Buddhism has a very wonderful set of what's called the four exertions. Mm -hmm. And those four exertions, they come out of the, the, um, uh, the uh, one of the stages of the Eightfold Path called right effort. Sama Vayama in Pali. And uh, this, these four right exertions or four exertions endeavors, some people translate it. One is you have these negative tendencies in, in narrative, if you will, and feeling that you can't separate those two. That's again, form and color, sure. narrative okay. and feeling. Uh, okay. The ones that are latent, they're not patent, they're latent. We don't necessarily hear them, but we know they're there because we've seen them at work in our life. So what do we do to counter those? Well, that might take the form of prayers and rituals and other things, songs, whatever it takes. There's all different ways of doing it. And the, and the, and the Buddhists go into quite a few different ways of tackling those latent negative narratives and feelings that we have. And mm -hmm. then there's the ones that, the negative ones that are uprisen, that are active. Klishta vritti, they're called in yoga. Right. And, and those afflicted, uh, modifications of experience, those have to be tackled in a slightly different way. There are some overlapping common commonalities in how you uh, deal with those, but they have to. There are differences and important ones. And then, of course, you have the latent good tendencies, ones that incline us toward liberation from our suffering and and, and encourage a tranquility, an opening to the tranquility within us, and that's latent 
And we know we can encourage it by certain prayers, mantras, songs, music, whatever it takes, that'll keep your mind going back to that good place. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you feel good some days. How do you maintain that? How do you sustain those good feelings and keep them alive as, as long as you can so that you can continue to access tranquility at, a, at deeper and deeper levels? So these four exertions are very important part of part of what's called right effort in Buddhism. Yeah, and you can see where that would really come into play with um, depression or yes. sadness, oh, yeah. anger. Yeah. And yeah. once those things get a foothold, yeah. it's so much harder to dispel if, if you can catch it right as it's arising. Yes. Which, going back to waking up in the morning example, mm -hmm. you know, that's, I think, a really good time when you can just see it so much more clearly. Yes, you're not agitated. Because you're, <laughs> you're just coming out of a slumber and you Rested. you're like, oh, look at that. Oh, look at that. Yeah. <laughs> Am I yeah. going to go with it? It's well, a decision. There's always a decision made somewhere. Yeah, well, we don't make those decisions. And I'll, and I'll explain why. There is no, there's no such thing as a decision. That's a myth that we've created because we've created a soul that has to aspire to God and obey God's rules. St. Augustine helped us with that quite a bit. So, uh, you know, you have this free will to either obey God or to disobey God, you see? And so totally up to us. Nothing to do with karma. Hmm. Totally up to us, you see? So we can feel real good and guilty when we make mistakes and we give the priests a lot more money. So that's what, at least that's what Martin Luther thought. So um, right, well, that also leads into uh, into into salvation, right? That's right. So theology, we could get back to that if you like. I just want to add this one thing though to it before I forget too. I have the same problem. I forget things immediately, and I think I just forgot what I was going to say here. But what was I talking about anyway? I forgot. Um, uh, it's free will. No, before that, I, that was that was a decide decision. Decisions. Well, decisions being free will, and, and they're not our thoughts. They're not our thoughts, right? So what we have to do is add momentum to the positive by repetition. That's called practice. Like we practice learning how to shoot pool or play ping pong or baseball or something or woodcraft. You have to practice. And that develops the karmic momentum inside of you and it refines it so that you gather strength from that momentum but it's not like you're going to make the decision to change your thoughts at that moment if the momentum's there you will change your thoughts and that takes sometimes it takes karma that's always behind karma that's always behind well, that's, karma yeah. that's always behind karma there's no so beginning that's, to this. that's what i wanted to hear is okay but then there's always something behind that yes, that's, that's right. not my thought it's, that's you know, correct so that goes for the negative too Right. So mm. it goes back to the old saying, it's turtles all the way down. That's right. I like that. But I'll show you something. You okay. should, what do you should do? I just happen to have turtles. You just. Oh, what's Jim going to do? Can you see? Oh, oh <laughs> no. Get out. We just get got that? This, another gift. Another. Uh, what was it called? Thrift shop gift from Catherine. Whoa! Isn't that neat? Wow. What a good find! Isn't that something? I think she paid six dollars. Oh, oh. Well, how interesting! How much it looks like a spine. Yeah, it does really. look like a spine. I, here's your cervix here, and your. Whoa! And, uh, I've never seen that's one. Oh, that's know. wonderful. Five thousand seven hundred dollars, and it's yours. Jeez, <laughs> Catherine gets a gold star. Oh, she's good. And she found it on the exact same shelf as she found the really the uh, bell, the... Japanese uh, bell. This wow. Bell. Yeah, gong, I should say. Wow. So you get the picture of this momentum now. Very this good, Steve. This karma, Look these at you. Show and tell. Huh? Good for you, show and tell. Yeah, yeah. So it is all right. Over. So I get this idea like, okay, so. Then where does responsibility comes in? Come in. Who's responsible? What do you mean by use? What do you mean by that word? How are you using that word? I need to know that. Ah, let's see what kind of assumptions are in play when we're using that word. 
I. Well, I is I. I is I'm a, a big doer. Is a big assumption, I isn't it? Yeah. I'm the thinker of my thoughts, right? Okay. And I have my past and my experiences over the course of my life and my culture have no relationship to this moment I feel now that's totally without causality. It's like a brand new moment, a brand new world with nothing in it because there can't be anything in it. Where would it have come from? Well, I wonder as well. Okay, uh, I wonder. <laughs> that's our grammar, we can't help that. It's really challenging, but this is a good exercise to be challenged on language. Yes, I know what I wanted to talk about now. Just remember Smirty. That's okay. all you have to do. Smirty. Do me a favor. So what comes to mind is a small child, as it's developing, if, if karma is the operative principle at work here mm -hmm. that is driving everything, Mm -hmm. That's an accumulation of experience. That's correct. So how does it work when there's threadbare amount of karma to, to move through an action? So where does it, like, where does it begin? So where does the karma... It has begin? no beginning. There is no beginning. How could there be a beginning? You'd have a beginning from nothing. You, nothing creates nothing. Okay. Right. It's always been this case. We find ourselves in experience. We don't come to it. I can right? see that. So we find ourselves being driven by the past that we didn't do. We didn't do it. It just can't look, look at the way in which our educational system is structured. And you can understand it quite re readily. It's totally different than the way the Chinese traditional education system function or the Indian or the Filipino for all we know. So we are, the, we are the product of these prior actions of body, speech, and mind of other lives that exist, that pre-existed us. That's so that's I've seen and unseen. Does yeah. it also come into play then that it's the, the karma and the actions of the people around the infant who- if, Yes, yes, very much so. It, who we, put, we, put that into the child who- they don't put it, that into existence for the child in a manner of speaking yes but I'm wondering remember where the, the karma come from it doesn't come from anywhere it's already here it's already here it's not something that you acquire it's already here it, we're just moving through uh, let me backtrack the sense of self that we develop over time and i use the word we develop i use that phrase cautiously the sense of self that we acquire, if you like, over a period of time, that is due to intersubjective reactions, not only with people, but with situations and things. But most that. importantly, for the mind, people, starting with our parents, if we're lucky enough to have them, mm -hmm. and, and all the interactions with friends and relations over the course of our lives, our subjectivity is constituted by all of these relationships. There is not some pristine subjectivity in there that hasn't been, that any, any subjectivity that's in there is not pristine. It is a composite of all sorts of experience that has accumulated, nothing is ever lost over a period of that person's life. And we speak of that person or that self as if there's this pristine, pure self in there, this core personality. There's no such thing. We hear and feel commonalities in my voice. I recognize that's my voice, isn't it? Well, it's a habit. Mm -hmm. uh, I, how do I know I'm the same person when I wake up in the morning? How do I know that? Mm. I hear the same, there's a feel, there's, a, there's habit of mind, there's feelings, uh, there are habits. We are habits, and those habits are put together into subjectively, intersituationally, and in, 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 in our relationship with simple objects. So that is an accumulation, a sediment, as the phenomenologist would call it, a karmic sediment, we'll call it, from the East. Okay, now, what you brought up before about becoming aware of these narratives in the morning, some mm -hmm. of these negative narratives that we get caught. That's the practice that both Buddhists 
And people who follow the Yoga Sutra path, that's, the, that's what they call sati in Pali or smirti as one of the balas or faculties or strengths, uh, capacities, it's also called, of, of, of a practice. You remember to practice. You don't decide, you remember. And that's what smirti means, remember. Oh, you don't decide. No. What do you do? Sit back and say, hmm, wonder what I should do now. No, you'll have options. <laughs> It'll come selflessly. If you've been a good practitioner, that is, you've been practicing, right. you'll have some good stuff come to you. Right. If you have been neglectful, not very interested, lackadaisical, well, then you're going to have so-so practice you know, and your habits will continue in a different direction than if you were a good practitioner. And that simply means that you've had good karma. Right. You follow me? So it's not that we decide or choose to be good. We remember. Did you ever see how memory works when you look at your mind, how you remember something? I think we've mentioned this before in our podcast. When somebody says to you, who was the guy that played in that movie in 1957? What was his name? He's a short little guy. I can't remember his name. And then somebody else says, oh, I know. It was Peter Laurie. He just came. Right. It doesn't, he doesn't say, hmm, is it Peter Laurie? Oh, it's Peter Laurie. He, it still comes. Right. Either way. Oh, oh whenever, whenever you forget a name, the worst thing you can do is go try to look for it. Yeah. And it's the same thing when There's we no use the word forgetting. It's like I forgot. Places. Like, you know what I mean? You know, like we say, I forgot in English. What do we do? Hide it in some place we're going to forget? You know, it's not something we do. Just like remember, it's not something we do. Mm -hmm. It's not executed by a sense of self. It is something that happens. We forget or we remember. But yeah. nobody's doing it. No. If you watch it closely, you can see nobody's doing it. No, we've been modeling uh, human behavior on uh, on computers for so long that we think we have like you know storage units somewhere, and we have RAM. We do. Have, you know, <laughs> it's called karma. In a way, right? Hard drive. It's, 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 it's well, that literally. that would be the cloud, right? The cloud, yeah, that's right. The uh, prakriti, mula prakriti. Yeah. The the iCloud or whatever cloud it is, Amazon's cloud. The yeah. iCloudius, yeah. Like, oh, gosh. <laughs> He's so good. He can't help himself. So that, how are we doing? That is selfless. Yeah, right. That is. That's why it comes to him like that. It he's just practiced. like pops out. Yeah. He's practiced at it. He's good at it. You know, he's a practitioner. He's a practitioner. And that's the way it works with everything we do. Well, and that what, um, you know, they, they say the, the, uh, <laughs> one of the goals of practice is to get out of the way of yourself. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty good. I, it's pretty good. And so, I like so what about the soteriology? Well, the right. And I forget what we're going to tie it into, but you, you were talking about Augustine, I think, and this, uh, oh, because you're talking a little bit about the souls. That's another word that, that, that uh, I have more trouble with that than I do with uh, what so soul uh, consciousness, you know, okay, looking, okay. right, looking for, looking for, uh, looking for a soul in my experience yeah you know? yeah um but redemption and i guess i've been reading redemption. this author named john lamb lash and his um his main book is called not in his image and he's a pretty interesting writer and he's and I, I, certain parts I'm not fully sure I'm not on board with but basically what he does is he's taken all of the gnostic texts mm. and um, come up with a, a fairly cohesive narrative of, of what they refer to, right? Because, you know, the most, most of the scholarship, I think, is just that, you know, they found, they knew about Gnostic texts, a lot of them for about, from the, the Christian apologist writers, the, the, the so-called uh, fathers who, um, you know, who, who wrote against, you have, you know, uh, you know, Arrhenius and uh, Arrhenius, yes. Clement and uh, a, bunch of these, a bunch of these guys who, who wrote against because they were, uh, because they were, paganism was seen as a threat to them. Right, right. And 
one of the things that he develops, and, and I, I, I don't want to butcher it too much, but well, go ahead. but he has a critique. But his critique, and and this also goes back to someone who worked with Peter Kingsley. Also, his critique on on what became Christianity is what we call the word soteriology. Soter means uh, savior. Uh, it also means savior. fat. What's that? It also <laughs> means fat. Fat. Fast. In Greek. It derives from the word for fat or heavy. Huh. It, it even bears some relation to, I think, the word cow in Sanskrit. I'm not sure about that. I have to look cow this up. Is, so cow is um, like gal in Sanskrit, That's but there's, it's bad. also there's a bent. Bow in, yeah, bow, bow in Irish. You look up a soteriology, and I think, I think it means fat. And, I did. I didn't see that, but, yeah. I, but I didn't do a full look. Anyway. The, the way it's the way it's used is is this whole redeemer thing, the idea of the redeemer, and and someone who's going to save you. And um, this was uh, according to John Lamb Lash, and uh, and and I think he's got some good points. And I said also Peter Kingsley is that when that aspect took over Christianity, um, it became something that was just say for the most part detrimental to to um uh to <laughs> it's it, detrimental to non-human suffering all right it brings in a lot of suffering even though its purported uh thing is to eliminate human suffering by accepting this outside Same. being as, as as john on lash calls him this off-planet deity as uh as as your savior as your salvation, yeah. right? Like aliens, space aliens. Well, kind of. and, and, and there are people who argue that too. Yes, I know. Right? <laughs> so, so I guess, I, I guess as it's something that I've been, but that spills over. I mean, it's been part of Christianity, you know, whatever, since 300, 200, you know, since early on. And, um, and it's part of the reason why they, they, were ruthless in in getting rid of anything pagan because the pagans really didn't have that you had a little bit of it with say the orphics and with um you know with plato to a certain extent but it wasn't really this idea of saving the soul because in order to save the soul you had to go back to augustine right who also gave us the the the, the lovely original sin that we needed to be saved from and who and you know until he did that we didn't right um <laughs> you know, talk about language creating worlds, right? And, yeah. and creating karma. I mean, right. just look at that karmic momentum of, right. of salvation and, you know, up to the point of, you know, Jehovah's Witnesses knocking on your door and, and you know, and they're just so convinced. And we're, and one of the things that we're finding, pardon me if I'm rambling on, but one right. of the things we're finding is that a number of People who are just doing podcasts that we've been following for a while are suddenly saved by, by Jesus, by Christ. Is They're suddenly, right? all of a sudden, you know, they were fine. And then all of a sudden, they just, they, they need to uh, express that they've been saved. Um, and you move, and of course, you can extend this whole soteriological uh, mindset karmic momentum to you know people expecting trump to save them people <laughs> yeah. expecting biden though just as long as we get rid of trump biden or the democrats will save us you know it's 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 gotten so inculcated into into our veins as a you know as a country that um everybody is really seems to be suffering from this particular delusion of, of, of an external savior. I mean, you know, and we used to joke about it. Well, you know, it's either the aliens, then it was the Indigo children are gonna save us and this, that, and the other thing, um, you know, but now it's, 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 uh, it's, it's a pandemic. Well, yeah, and, and I guess the uh, saying that God wins now, this is like the new mantra that's coming out of a lot of people, so. That's, that mm -hmm. seems to be in the mix somehow. Right, and you have to say, what do you mean by God? Yeah. Exactly. Well, no one. That's the thing is, no one says what they mean by consciousness. No one tells me what they mean by the fifth fucking dimension. 
and and everyone is like talking about God, like everyone knows what they're talking about. Yes, that's right. And like God would take sides, like God, you know, you know what God is going to take sides. He's going to judge it, right? Isn't judge. that what people are afraid of being judged by God to not enter the kingdom and have well, a terrible realm of hell to deal with? Right. Well, and that was also, according to John Lennon, last part of this. He 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 put a particular group, the group that wrote the. Um, the Dead Sea Scrolls, who are, who are not the Essenes. Oh, no. Um, no I don't think that one no more. Though. No, no, that's a long story. Yeah, that's why I didn't, that's why I retracted. I knew yeah. that was all long. Yeah, and I couldn't explain it anyway. That's okay. But I'll have to but, look him up. But it's, but it's a, but it's another particular group that, that, because if you read, you know, their, their, the, the Dead Sea Scrolls, which he has, um, you know, the, the, I guess it wasn't well another part of it uh, besides the, the salvation thing is what we we're just talking about which I can't remember um <laughs> geriatric clinic is gonna yeah, be old star, yeah I don't know what you know it's like <laughs> it's like the loose black routine you know the, the bunch of guys getting around hey you know remember that movie oh yeah that was with the, yeah I don't remember yeah it was with what's his name yeah 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 oh yeah they and they all think they remember the movie yeah that's pretty much how it works too isn't it <laughs> you know so this is this is this is this is our smurfy um just I don't know I guess I was bringing it up because it seems to be an and like like Chris was saying an uprisen part at least of the discourse that we the, that we encounter, you know, even if you try to listen to various alternative news and people that seem to be trying to do things for the betterment, or well, let's just say in, in terms of justice, mm -hmm. right? Which of course, you know, Socrates would have a dialogue on that, and they they wouldn't come to an answer to what justice is either, you know. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so I, I guess it was just more more or less an observation of of that of this of this really, and I guess this is what happens when times are difficult. Instead of looking to your own experience, looking to that quietude, looking to that silence, you're looking for outside redemption. Yeah, well, um, let me ask you a question, and I don't mean to be rude, but what do you mean when you say? going through hard times we're going through hard times what does that mean right well when people well this is the all right so it's another narrative yeah right, that right. you know and for the most part i don't have hard times i wake up the hard times as we talked before is media driven yeah mm -hmm. but well it's not but, only media driven it's also fear driven but and but of, people, you know, electricity wrapped up in that. Let's just say, unless it's a complete fabrication, you know, people are getting arrested who are whatever at the Capitol January 6th and things like that, you know. So, this is this is this is the balance. They, they may, I do actually, I do know people who are there, though I don't know anyone who's been arrested. I do know of people who have died from the COVID shot. I do, you know. You know, so I there, I know certain there's certain parts of it in my experience. Uh, yes, of course. And I'm not discrediting your experience. Right. What I'm saying is, when you talk about we are going through hard times, we as human beings have always gone through hard times. Yeah. There's never been a time when we haven't had hard times. Yeah. It could. And be. we get this illusion that things are getting worse and worse. They're not getting any worse. There's just a lot more of us. <laughs> well, yeah, it's getting. No, no, no. It gets worse where in my head right? that's right it's, it's, that's it's, it's right in the thought right. it gets worse it gets worse in the narrative that, that i run yeah yeah you know? so we have to be careful what we do with these you know so, what our practice can we bring practice to that right so and this gets back to chris with the alone with others because this is definitely how you know if if you adopt this type of yogic slash spiritual stance or, or approach to the narrative of our own lives, you know, you definitely are alone. You know, you're always alone. You know, you're, you're always alone in your yeah. own experience. You have nobody else. Yeah. Even, 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 even though we could look at somebody and say, oh, there's my friend Joe, you know, say, oh, but Joe is existing for you in your experience. Mm -hmm. You don't have Joe, you have your Joe. Right. You don't have the world, you have your world. Which I imagine point. is is what Stephen Batchelor was probably 
talking I don't about know. in that book, but I never finished reading it's it. It's a long time ago. I, I, matter of fact, I think I did read the whole book. It's a very small book. It's I a small book. I taught a course it, in it or so, or used it in a course at some point in time. Did you? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's so. It's pretty thin. Yeah, it's a small book, right? I just, I remembered a little more of it, but I like the title. The title, like you said, the title is great. Right. Yeah. But I, I only say these things because I see so much uh, of my own mind when I listen to too much of, of um, podcasts or this or that, I, I, time to turn it off because it becomes too dominant and it excludes a very more, more positive things that make me feel better. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying I'm running away from anything, but I'm not running toward suffering either. I have to know when I, I have to be judicious in my narrative approach to life. You know, I don't want to, I don't want to suffer. Right. And e even with being, I'm it's no big surprise to you two. I, I've been ill for a while and I know how I have to be, sa I have to sanitize yeah. a lot. Mm, that's true. So, and that's, that goes for everything. We should all be sanitizing, yes. but we don't know what lies ahead if we do make the effort to do it. There is an abiding tranquility and peace in there that is, it's accessible to all, except maybe someone with brain da damage or something, but the, it is a possibility, tranquility is a possibility for all of us. And right. that is something we don't know exists because we want to turn it into consciousness, God, the, 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 the salvation, the aliens, mm -hmm. we want to turn it into a thing and not letting it come forth into our minds and nourish us because we're too preoccupied. As so, I think one of you was pointing that out earlier. We're so preoccupied with those narratives. Well, it's palpable too, that feeling of tranquility. I remember- yeah. It's not thought. There are nodal points in your life, if you look back where you would say, oh yes, I experienced that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it seems like it's a very rare condition. Uh, That's where we To are. be aware yeah. of it. Yes, to be to aware, be aware yes, of it. To live it out, yes. When we were in Australia 10 years ago, we went down to the beach. Uh -huh. And we took our shoes and socks off and we walked in the water and it was just, divine it was just mm. lovely mm -hmm. and like not a care in the world mm. and we stayed for about a half an hour 40 minutes and got back in the car and as we were driving back it hit me like a ton of bricks I was like wow <laughs> I have no anxiety no angst I feel incredibly calm wow nice that's a good it start. was palpable yeah oh yeah. and there was i think there were one or two other times in my life that i can remember that level mm -hmm. yeah. of tranquility right. one was in thailand and and another one was um what was the other thing was another one um but yeah so that seems to be something that is Yes, it was Bursa in Turkey. It was what? I'm sorry. It, the city of Bursa. We went to a, when Steve and I went to Turkey in 1985, wow. one of the first cities we went to was Bursa, B U R S A. Okay. And we went to this. It was a, it was a, it was a Sufi tekke. It, it was a, a mosque, but it was a mosque within, within a, a, a Sufi school. We actually, oh, yeah. yeah. It, it was, was small. It wasn't. Yeah. It wasn't one of the big, you know, no, uh, it was just source a tracks. It was, on a silent, it was just on a side road. Wasn't I think I by read the, by the Green Mosque. Yeah, I just read it. It was like a Sufi place, and we just went there. Wow. Nice. And we went in, and we someone greeted us. This older man greeted us and talked to us and mm -hmm. welcomed us, and he just let us be. He said, "Please, mm -hmm. you know, sit." And we sat down, and very nice. And I got plugged in. Wow. <laughs> yeah. It's just like. The possibility. Well, well, now you know. I mean, you know. Well, well, when we left that building, I was floating on a cloud. I was like about a foot off the ground. Well, you know, there, there's. I think there is something to be said for entering a place where people have been doing a lot of spiritual practice. I don't know what what I would have to do to make that true. 
experience it because it just I've no 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 that, I, mean, I can experience that in I, I can experience it on the toilet it doesn't matter where I am yeah I, but I really is, experience it on the toilet though you know what I mean I yeah. can but but the point is that if I say that this place is reserved for this and that's why I experience it then you have to set conditions for the experience no that condition experience could be had it's not even an experience in the depths of suffering painful suffering you can feel and, and I'm not right. saying that. Right. I, I know you're not saying I'm that. Not I'm saying, saying that. that. You know, there's, you know, I, I've stories of people at bus stops and, you know, yeah. or, or playing volleyball, I've heard. So uh, why did you say then that this, you, that there's but, something but about what people there are, But I, th I think there's something to be said, which is what I said. Yeah. about What's to be about, said then? About certain, but that there are certain places where that sort of thing is facilitated. Do okay, you... let me look. Let's look at this. Look, hold on. Let's look at this. Places. What is a place? What we do have is experience. Is we an experience. don't have a place. True. But I'm still entering a building. The a place. The experience of entering a place, whether, you know, like whether that I call you... it a building or call it what. But it's an experiential space. Yes, I realize that. But it's not something separate from you. It's you. It's right. you in relation to what you're anticipating, where you're coming from, what you've read about, where you come from in, the, in your understanding of Islam and Sufism. You brought a package deal to that place. I but may have, doesn't... but I don't. I, I may have. But I, I don't think that's necessarily. But doesn't this, don't we do that with everything, though? Don't we do hand. that? Yes, hold on. Don't we do that with everything? <laughs> bring something to it. There's no it. There's only what we bring. Our experience is all there is. Yes, Chris. Significant setting. Remember when we were in class in, in the ashram, and, and I think you may even have written a paper on yeah, yeah. the significant setting. Yeah that is conducive to practice. How does it get to be conducive? Through repetition and That's through right. and and That's right. That's right. That's right. That's all I'm saying. Right. That there's no place that will give that to us. The, the place is in our experience. That's the place. And that's where consciousness is. It's nowhere else. That and makes everything sense. is in our experience. There's nothing outside of it. And that's what the reason I was so harsh about this is because it's insidious how Western materialism, physicalism, naturalism can sneak into our grammar and move us away from the realizations that we need, the understandings that we need. Because once we reify a place that's different than every other place, we've entered into materialism. You understand? I understand, but I'm I'm still not fully on board. That's okay. That's just um, give me some thought and see what happens. You know, because and and I'm uh, I'm just trying to figure out how to um, get around it. how to work it out. Well, there <laughs> are well, yeah, you know, we'll just say, but this is not my experience. But a lot of people say go to um, whatever the Ajanta caves or a cave where where you know where a lot of practice and meditation has gone on, or you know. Or a particular church, or something like that, which, yeah. which of course we're saying sure. is out, that it exists outside my experience. But there's something because because others have gone there and done spiritual work in those places, as opposed to and because I know if I, I because I could feel if I go into a place, maybe you go to a place where 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 a murder was committed in a hotel room. Well, this is what I was going to bring up. Yeah. You know, I think it goes both ways. It goes both ways. Where, where, because, because even though it's only my experience and the world's being generated through me, still, you know, if someone, if someone, you know, moves my garbage pail, you know, without me knowing, without me hearing it, and I go out and it's moved. Someone has done something in my world, right? Well, not, done not, something not, not experientially. Had to, you had to infer it. Well, some, of course. But either way, mm -hmm. either way, I still think that 
there's and, and I don't know what you want to call it because I think that goes back to we I think we had a different maybe a difference on this concept of oneness and this in the oneness of Prakriti. Um and that and that whether or not because of that there is a certain connection that all of our experiences have. What do you mean the oneness of Prakriti? Because because Prakriti is one. Because the, the ground of what does being that mean to say the that? ground of the ground of being is the what do you mean being? Well here's the ground the ground of everything. We call it Mula Prakriti. No, 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 no. What you're doing here is you're making the same mistake that Western metaphysicians have been making for over a hundred years with this. No way. There's no being. There's you plus what what is it? Right. Well, good. Prakriti, right. Prakriti was never meant to be a material cause of anything. It was the ground out of which your experience rises and falls into. Okay, so it's the ground of, all right, so let's clarify that, what's called the ground of experience. That's right. Right, but it's still, whether it's material or whatever it is, it has to have some sort of existence for me to experience. I mean, there's something, it has to, there has to be one called a thing, but something just generate my experience, or I or I just wouldn't exist. When it said when it, when but you it say, says, go ahead. When you say that it comes out of your that mula prakriti is the ground of your experience, the way in which phenomena or the source of phenomena in your experience rising and falling constantly, that is mula prakriti. The source of that and the destination of that is called mula prakriti or pradana avyakta, unmanifest. It doesn't mean that everybody's in this one big thing called prakriti. It only pertains to experience. And what metaphysicians from the West have done is say, oh, that must be like the, the quantum level of energy hmm. in physics, because it seemed to be something that pervades everything everywhere, like consciousness pervades something everywhere. No, consciousness pervades your experience. That's what it pervades. And nothing takes place outside of your experience. And for me, that's all there is. <laughs> well, there's something for you. That's for me. That for you. You don't know what I'm experiencing. You have no idea. I don't. Well, you, you can have I an don't. idea, but it may not be accurate. I don't. But somehow, Somehow, there has to, it seems to me, given <laughs> given other things, there has to be some connection. Because you've assumed it. I'm assuming, or let's just say, I'm assuming. <laughs> In our language and communication. But I, I'm assuming that there's, what's that? that the, there's a connection in our language and communication. And we believe that we're talking about the exact same things. No, I'm not even talking about that. Well, that's you said connection. I just thought that's what you were alluding to. No, that we can connect with each because, other because somehow, because somehow, I'm running. I'm this 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 thing. This thing runs back into some sort of solipsism that I that I am not. Now, well, okay, about. let's let's put that to, on the table. What do you understand by the word solipsism? That that only I exist. No, that's not what this is. There is no I. That's just it. The I is only a direct my, function. Right. Only my experience is. That's right. only we call it my experience out of convention. It's just experience. And I could use another word. I could use a dozen other words. I'm trying to convey that all we have is what we directly experience in our lives. That's what we have. We can't get outside of our skin. We can't do it. You can try, but you can't do it. Now, I know, believe me, Steve, I sympathize. I have been down that road for so long and been so humiliated so many times about being wrong but my misunderstanding of all of this, I took me years, over 20 years to clarify all this. And it was so humiliating for me to realize how stupid I have been for so long. But it wasn't my fault, it was karma. I didn't put those obstructions to my clarity in, the, in place. My karma did that, my history, my background. And I feel very different, very sorry for anybody who has to put up with my bullshit right now and me talking about this stuff and trying to turn the dial a little bit so yeah. you could just get a little more light in there. 
It's very difficult for you and for me to watch you somehow things put it all together, but we can't because there's only your experience. That's all we have. Now, you, if you can help me understand your perspective, I might change my mind. You don't think I can cut? No. Go ahead, please talk. Well, the word that just keeps bopping, popping into my head is how radical this is. Yes, it is. And that's why it's so difficult. So other, so other. That's what I like. Yeah, it's just because there's a frustration in it. Yeah, there's there the is. There's pain. Dream, tension and frustration in it because every time I go to say something descriptive it's like hold on a minute yep yep so it's like everything you know is wrong no it, you know here let me just interject one little point can you imagine have no having no one to turn to and getting more and more confused and more and more I had no one to talk to no one and I had to do this all on my own. And well, the humiliation was unbearable. I suffered. That's why I withdrew from all my friends and all my relations. I couldn't stand it anymore. It was horrible. And I wouldn't wish this on anybody. And I'm glad I'm here to disrupt just a little bit and let in a little more light. And that's the existential aloneness. I don't know what that means. <laughs> you know what I mean? No. Well, that's what I'm saying, Jean, is that that's the frustration and the beauty of it is that we have to retool every bit of language that we take for granted. Yeah, that's right. And it's like ripping scar tissue. Oh, yeah. Painful. It's Painful. like, you know, when you had your, your knee operations? Right. I remember. How could he and, forget? <laughs> and 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 the skin was just like so bad. And but then the physical therapist made you do that, right? And the pain was so extreme. It was, yeah. Oh. Yeah, I had I had a yeah, my knee solidified and I had a in college I had to lay on the table and hang weights off of it to oh. break, the, break the scar tissue little by little. Oh god. But I, these conversations. This is why I've never been in the Lotus. <laughs> <laughs> I don't blame you. <laughs> but that's why I can't fit in one. This is like uh, this is like walking on hot coals, and oh, it it's is. like it's it's like danger, Will Rogers. You know, every word you say can be just uh, turned like yeah poison arrows against you. Like oh, oh wait yeah. a minute, what do you mean by that? Do you understand? And it's very frustrating. Of course it is. It's I know. very it's like, okay, I've never examined that. Okay, well, I've never examined that. I was well, suicidal for years. That's how bad it was for me. I I've heard suicidal. that this, I, you know, I've heard mm -hmm. that people who go through this just suffer terribly. Yeah. Yeah. I never told anybody except Catherine. Though. Yeah. I had my methods, my plans. Every night I practice, I couldn't go through it. What do you mean you couldn't go through? You couldn't go I through. I couldn't what? put the knife into my jugular vein, which is what I kept doing every night. I would sit there with a the knife and just keep hitting it and just see if I, how close or how much closer I could get to killing myself. Really? That went on for years. It was horrible. I wouldn't wish that on anybody because I didn't know. I couldn't get clarity. And Angela was of no help to me mm. because she was from the East. Yeah. How does she know what our Western is? She knows what you're going through. She couldn't deal with it. So I drank, I drugged, I did everything to kill the pain. And finally, I only saw one way out. That was suicide. Couldn't take it. That's mm -hmm. right. I was, on, I was 19 to yeah. college and that was it. I, I, I had a, yeah, I had a smoke pot and drink myself to sleep every night. Yeah. yeah. But I just reached the point. I was like, yeah, okay. Well, it was just a matter of yeah. putting together the things to put it. But then, uh, but then uh, something shifted. Good. And, it, and then I thought it was over, you know, after a while you think it's over and then you go and face some, another challenge, cancer, twice, heart, open heart surgery mm. once. And mm. it just kept coming and coming and coming, never stops. And then you get stronger and you get more. And next thing you know, 
you're back into your meditation and you have no, you can't go anywhere and you just go deeper and deeper and deeper until finally there's no more depth. The depth is right here. There's no depth needed. It's already the case. There's nothing to do. But who's going to believe that? <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> It's horrible. I know what you're going through. And I hate to be the injection of the COVID vaccine. <laughs> it's just horrible what you have to go through to go through this. But hopefully with the tools that I can provide some slight linguistic advantages, perhaps, that we can, we can come to terms with each other with this. It's hard. It's very hard. It's, I used to cry and cry all the time. It was bad. I went on antidepressants for two, three years. Couldn't function. So I had to take away every, from everybody. Except Catherine. She's the only thing that kept me going. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a horrific burden. Yeah, it yeah. does actually makes, a, makes all the difference when you're going through it with somebody. Yeah. So anyway, that's I, I feel bad when I see you struggling, and I know what this well, is I'm like. Struggling to, I'm struggling to be clear. Is what I'm I know. Doing. I know. So that's why I shut up for now because if I'm not, if I don't have the clarity for myself, I'm not. I'm. I, I know what it is I want to say, but the only thing I can come up with to explain it or abstract examples, and that's not what I. You what know, you really want to say. It's not. It's not what. I, it's not. It's not. It's not the point. Right. Okay. It's not the point. Yeah. Well, it'll come to you when you, you know, you'll, you, you I, I admire your bravery for just putting up with me. <laughs> oh, gee. <laughs> oh, geez. It's hard. We get the Valor Merit Badge. Put your head in their hands and just shake your head. We get the Valor Merit Badge and I can do this. So I'm telling you, no, it's hard for people. I know. It's hard. It's and, so then you, hard. and then you'll, you may not see it now. And then in a few days, you'll say, Boy, that guy's such an asshole. Why does he treat me like this? But you yeah. know, it's harder to deal with the. Gee, with, I don't think so. It's harder to, to. It was harder to deal with the with the external world as real and all the fuckery there. That's right. That's right. And how yeah. often? And, and we did that for almost our whole lives, or at least a majority of it. Yeah, because at least because we'll look, we're looking for an end of suffering. We're looking for what we call moksha. Yeah, which, which you know, when I was looking up soteriology, this redemptive program before, mm -hmm. you know, they imputed it onto the yeah. yoga system through the word moksha, which means you know liberation or freedom. Yeah, times you know, and and, if, and 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 I realized, and maybe you see if this works for you, is that you know freedom is not freedom from or freedom to, but it's freedom within. Yeah, that's right. Freedom, I like that. Freedom yeah. within circumstance. I like that. Mm. Um, yeah, the freedom is the indifferent nature of consciousness or purusha, and it can to get touched. It's like the surface of the mirror, and no matter what you put in it, it doesn't get affected. Indifferent, is, that's a good word. Right. Inactive, indifferent. It's just peace itself. It's peace itself. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, it doesn't, you don't acquire the peace. That is the peace. Right. Right, right. You get back to it's already the case, and then yes. you know, and then we're just covering it over with our minds and our yeah. thoughts and ourselves and our anxieties and our worries, yeah. and, you know. And in the best of my quote unquote spiritual experiences, there's no fear because there's no self to be freaking afraid of anything, which goes back to the Upanishads, you know. That's right. Of, of what was I afraid? Yes, I like that death when there is no death, right? Did you think of that story when? Uh... Yeah. yeah. Yama was talking yeah, to Indra, I think it was, right? Um, there is that one too that, I, that, I, looked, that I can't find it. Yajnavakya. Yeah, yeah, with uh, Indra and um, Yama, wasn't it? I don't remember exactly. Well, Indra going to Yama with yeah. um, with uh, with with the Rakshasha or some other. Um, I don't remember. You know, and Indra always takes it one step further. Yeah. Right to get. Oh, no, Yama final... would say, "No, now you have to study with me another twenty years." Right, so right, right. Have... And so, Indra, right. So Andrew would hang out if I'm yeah. the same story, and the other day, the other demon would hang out too, and then re reach, finally reach an answer. It's satisfied, and the demon took off. <laughs> and then he hung out for another twenty years. And Yama said, "The final secret of death is there is no there death." There is no death, right? I remember that. I remember the punchline. Okay. Yeah, the deathless. The Buddha called it the deathless. The Amara. 
And uh, the reason there's no death is because there's nothing alive in that sense. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> death is a concept in our minds. That's all it is. But we are still afraid. Doesn't make us not afraid of it you know? yeah. or reluctant to do it. You know, Ortega brought that up. He said, there's only two things in this world that's for everybody else, your birth and your death. <laughs> oh, that was Ortega. Yeah, yeah. I love that. Hey, somebody else probably said it, but you know how it is. Gets around. <laughs> when we were, when well, we, it's the truth. Yeah. When, no, we were no. the, uh, when we were in the, when we were in the ashram so many years ago, and uh, um, yeah, actually, I was just thinking we we're coming up to a 34th wedding anniversary, and you were at, at our wedding. Yes, I was. It was a beautiful ceremony. I but I had, um, you know, I, I very rarely would have, have visions of meditation, but I had this vision, and the vision was of um, was of Yama. Wow. Bullheaded, blue, dark blue god of death. Yeah. And he was oh. drinking blood out of a skull cap. Oh, that's, I think I've seen something like as that on a poster or something. On a tanka. It's, it's probably on a tanka, tanka was it? somewhere. Most but, likely. But, but it was like, but the thing was the, the absolute calmness. Oh, wow. Death. Isn't that something? Drinking the blood out of a skull cap. Wow. Amazing. And you felt that calmness for that? Yeah. Yeah. And because because it, it's a kind of um, um you know graphic representation of there is no death it's the same thing yeah i like it very yeah. good it's, it's yeah and uh, kali has the the tongues and she's playing the tongues and the blood's coming out of it and she's licking up yeah the blood from the rakshasas from the skulls are those demons i forget the, the, yeah. the, well the, the rakshasas yeah so there was the great battle and every time the rakshasas would be hit or the demons would be hit with the sword and the blood would come gushing out every drop of blood made a new rakshasa that's right that's right so what do you do i mean I, that's this is right. what we're faced with right now right that's why yeah. i love these stories yeah they're great well simple she just licked it up yeah and that's like the death of experience it just keeps being absorbed into mula prakriti again and, it, and, it, just, and it, it's only two things hunger and death it says the, somewhere in the Upanishad, two things, hunger and death. And hunger is death. Hunger is death. death. We have desire, and then that comes, breeds death, and death breeds hunger. And, it, you know, it's amazing. <laughs> it's hard to learn how to use dentures. So what are we worried about? <laughs> My dentures right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I think we had a great... Uh, wow, this was a juicy one. Yeah. All right. I'm glad that uh, I wasn't... Uh, too unruly. Who says? Well, I do. I mean, I could get worse, but I don't. I used to, but I, I can't. I remember. I, part, of, part, of, part of the reason why I was so adamant when I was younger is because I, I myself was trying to struggle with my own understanding and I couldn't, I wasn't calm enough to be a good teacher. But I mean, you, it, nobody's um, born that way, Gene. Everybody has to. Yeah, but it's just learn. that I, I'm saying these things for a reason. I'm not just saying it about for me. Yeah. Whatever I'm saying, I'm saying for us. Yeah. And it may sound like I'm self-critical, but I'm not just saying it for me. Okay. Okay. So keep that in the back of your mind. I don't hate myself. I don't love myself because I don't have one. But if I did, I'd love myself. <laughs> yeah. Well, we love yourself. Thank you very much. I love yourself too. Uh -huh. too. All two of you. say himself. Do you want? Self himself oh yeah him. right i had a, a t-shirt with that on himself I oh, got yeah. catherine's yeah. father himself. yeah it's an irish I mean, thing. really it's like i hate it and i love it having mm -hmm. those those uh conversations but the stops you know remember mm -hmm. did you ever remember hearing the stories about gurjeef who would have the stop exercises no i never read gurjeef i tried uh, to read my readings with remarkable men but i couldn't Oh, that's too simple. That's like, yeah, that's like lollipop level. Oh, I didn't know. I just couldn't read it. It wasn't interesting to me. Yeah. But, um, uh, tells the Beatles about what he would do. Oh, well, that's that's a whole other thing. Yeah, that's just. Um, he would have this stop exercise where people would be out doing their karma yoga, be doing their work, and doing just whatever needed to be done, mm -hmm. and someone would say stop, and you would have to stop. Wow in whatever position you were in. Jeez, that could be embarrassing. <laughs> Hopefully not. 
But that's what these conversations remind me of when you say, well, what do you mean by consciousness, Chris? Mm -hmm. It's like, oh boy, you know, that sounds like I'm being rude. It's like I'm going along and I have this thought. I'm having, okay, I think I've got it all figured out how to say this the right way so I don't get stopped. But but that's where the lessons are. That's right. That's where you have to do that. So it's like a love hate relationship with that that process because it's painful the stop is death isn't it everything there's that death of that trajectory yeah right there's death again there's always death always death always death it's a sacrifice you know when you ever try to brush your teeth with your opposite hand can you imagine if you broke your hand and you had to do that do you know how painful that would be i mean that's a simple little example right Mm -hmm. But it would be so difficult because the karmic momentum, we call it skill. The karmic momentum is so powerful to use your whatever, your lefty or your right. I think you're lefty, right, Steve? You use your left. So it'd be hard for you to switch over and just do it right-handed with any skill unless you practice. Mm. And then you'd get really good at your right hand. And that's what this basic karma thing is. It's just doing skills. You actually gave that as a practice. I did do it as a practice. We did know. give us as a practice. And I did? Days. Really? Yeah. No, I thought you said I did it as a practice. No, no. Well, you may have. You I can't do it now because you don't have teeth. But if, if it, <laughs> you did. But you gave that as a practice. Do things with your opposite hand, which is, right. I'm, I'm a left-handed writer, but I throw right-handed so, I, you know, so I can, yeah, ambidextrous. Not as, as big a deal. Yeah, a lot of lefties are ambidextrous in, t- in a certain sense. Oh. Yeah, my brother was a lefty. So I know that from him, yeah. but um, yeah, the, I think I believe the nuns tried to stop me, but they were. <laughs> no, don't even go there. I don't know what you're getting at, but don't go. Oh there. no, yeah, the sinistrate, <laughs> left hand. Yeah, they, they there are a lot of there are a lot of people who were in Catholic school before uh before we were, yeah. who were beaten. In the 50s, their yeah. left hands were beaten so that they couldn't write with them, and they had yes. to over the right hand, which, which 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 is a detrimental thing. Yeah, because the sinistrate is is left in latin mm, um, sorry that's a and, sinister uh, and uh yeah. where sinister comes from because the left because lucifer sat on the left hand of god and uh michael sat on the right hand of god ah okay so um a dwat a dwat is, 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 is islamic and, and gauche is um is is left-handed in french um is that right what's i can, what's the latin for i don't know right man. Uh, I know in German. I don't know. You know it in German. Richt, yeah, that's Richt. right. The third Richt. Or Reich, Reich. same. Uh. Different ending. Hmm. All right. So we, so we close up shop. Yeah, it was really wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, you can talk to Chantani when she comes about the torture I put her through. Oh, good. That's well, a lot of laughs out of that. We were talking well, about it today. Chandani is is the uh, the person who founded the ashram. We went to it's her daughter, and, and she's actually coming for a visit with us. So yeah, that she talked to me so, about it today. So I don't know. Maybe we can wrangle a show together and see how that works out. Yeah, I was I I broached that with her. I said, would you ever like to come on? Oh, she went. Oh, she thought that was the greatest idea. Oh, good. Yeah, she loves you guys. Good. good. Well, we love her. I go sit in the back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, no, it'd be fun, you know. And sure, uh, she, said, she, if, she said, if you're feeling good, we, I, I would like to come up and yeah. see you, but well, I don't, I couldn't guarantee it. I don't want to, yeah. well, you know, say I'm going to feel good when, when I may not. So. We don't you know, even know when you know, we can do some, these kinds of sometimes things. Sometimes we feel pretty crappy too. So, you know, right. yeah, well, sometimes yeah. we're like, oh, good. We can take a nap. <laughs> yes. Yes. I know just how you feel. Believe All right. Me. We have All right. We're going we're gonna to close up. Thanks everybody for watching. Um, and let's what do we just need say, to, uh, any business? Well, business, we need oh. to say that we have locosophiabooks.com. So please, if you wish. We have a new book out. Just came out this website. Just got it in yesterday. And I have my paintings on fineartamerica.com. And anything and else? There's Jean's, Jean's, Jean's blog. blog. The yeah, Ulterior yeah. Dimension, where you, can, where you can hear more of this. Or see more of this if you could put up with and um and all the links will be below and uh, really appreciate everybody we've been you know getting yes. 
very much. Getting people watching, getting some comments. We enjoy yeah, it. I would we, say yeah. we really appreciate the comments. So if, don't be afraid to comment because we're not going to shoot down a stranger. We're just going to shoot no, down. No, we just shoot out we'll each be, other. We'll be nice. Nice. That's right. So we, we take the hit so you don't have we'll to. We'll play nice. Um, if you think we're totally nuts, just tell us why your reasons are for, for that. And yeah, we'll but gladly, we, I'll see if we can dispense with them readily like to say how much we really appreciate comments so yeah if we do you're, if you're kind of a shy person who doesn't ordinarily write comments mm -hmm. maybe you would make an exception yeah if you yeah. have a thought or uh, a question or a suggestion for a topic we're open and we'd really like to explore it so yeah that's well said chris Please thanks consider it that's a good idea. I, I, I'm sorry, I didn't think of it myself. <laughs> <laughs> you can think of it next okay. time. Yes, All right. All right. Take good care. night, everybody. Thank you both. Thank you, Gene. Thank you.